All right. And I it's almost bright enough to not turn on the lights to see if I can turn them on the halfway because it's, it's more pleasant that way, but it'll keep you awake better. Um And I had a random chemistry topic to talk about. Um, and I totally blanked on what it was going to be since, since you haven't taken your quizzes yet. Um, but I totally blanked on the quest. All right. Shows me need to write that stuff down. Um, all right. So we're going to work on geometries today and, and you know, kind of applying those Vesper shapes that we, that we mentioned. We talked, spent a lot of time with them in Gen Chem, right? Um, so we're going to talk about those today and and how that applies when you start piling them up on top of each other when you get those more than one central atom at a time. Uh, and we'll talk about hybridization and polarity and then we'll probably go quickly through drawing or organic structures since you already had some experience with that but we'll talk about the different um, types, the different styles of drawing because there's a different at different times we're going to want to use Skeletal structures versus complete structures, and versus they call them Kikuli structures. Um, so we're going to go through that and and talk about why we use them at different times. Um, but the main for right now, just until we get good at counting to four but not five, we're going to stick to complete structures for the most part. Draw out all those hydrogens. All right. So this is kind of where we ended the other day. We said, okay, instead of doing Lewis dot structures and showing and counting electrons to figure out, figure things out, we can kind of work backwards from that. So we can instead say, okay, well, unless there's a charge, we can just generalize by how many bonds and just assume that there's enough lone pairs to make up the difference. Right, so nitrogen has three vacancies, so it makes three bonds, and there's an extra lone pair there that doesn't always get drawn, um, because unless there's a charge to it, nitrogen still has to have eight electrons. So we're going to go with that assumption, everything's got a full valence. Everything has eight electrons, whether it's in the form of bonds or lone pairs. All right, so and these are most common um, most common elements that we're going to deal with carbon, obviously, it's not, it's not organic chemistry if it doesn't have carbon in it, um, nitrogen, oxygen, and then the monovalent elements are mostly going to be hydrogen, basically filling in any gaps that you have that aren't shown with, um, with other elements. And then the other monovalent, meaning just one bond, um, that we are going to have halogens popping up. Turns out halogens actually have a, have a um, really big purpose in organic, modern organic chemistry and synthetic chemistry, meaning trying to make things that we structures that we want. Um, and they actually they play a really big role in medicinal chemistry uh, because it turns out if you take some molecule that has some biological activity, like a neurotransmitter or a hormone, um, you don't always want to just administer a neurotransmitter as a treatment. Like we don't get, um, we don't treat ADHD by just giving people injections of dopamine. Um, what we do instead is we take a molecule that's similar to dopamine and introduce it to the system. And that gums up the quirks and allows the brain to sort of accumulate more dopamine than it would normally allow itself. If we just gave the brain straight dopamine, its brain's really, really good. Our cells are really, really good at just like, What's this doing here? It shouldn't be here and getting it back to where it was. So it would work for, I don't know, you know, 30 seconds or something like that. Um, but it turns out all you have to do is if you take dopamine and replace a hydrogen with a chlorine, for instance, you get a molecule that doesn't occur in nature, that the same enzymes can kind of work with in the body, but they're slower at it. And so that's what kind of is like, Gets, gets in the way and allows a backlog of dopamine to sort of accumulate in a way that, that has positive effects for people with ADHD, um, among other um, psychological or psychiatric diseases, disorders. Excuse me. So we see a lot of things. Um, in fact, there's a, I was just looking at this because I was trying to figure out which 
children's cough medicine to give my kids this you know, before bed versus before school. Because so they have two different antihistamines. One is a bromo compound, and one is the same compound but with chloro instead. And just switching out the chlorine for the bromine affects whether or not it's um, it affects how sleepy it makes you. So the the one that makes them more sleepy is for bedtime, and the one that's it's still an antihistamine but it doesn't make you quite as it's not as effective, doesn't make you as tired, would be what you would put in you know the children's day oil. Um, so we do see a lot of, of halogens, even though they don't show up in nature all that often. We don't see a whole lot of chlorinated, brominated um, compounds in nature. Typically, when we do see halogens in nature, it's as ions, chloride dissolved in water, or bromide, or iodide dissolved in water. So if nitrogen normally makes four bonds, or three bonds, if we have a nitrogen with four bonds, what must be true? So when it's, go ahead. Not isotope, because isotope doesn't have anything to do with electrons, right? Ion, ion it could be a different ion, yeah. It's, it's a, probably has a charge, because the other option is, because nitrogen when it's neutral, has three bonds and a lone pair. If we add an extra bond to that, well, there's two ways we that could happen, right? You could do it like that. Does that look right? Why not? Four but not five, right? That's 10 valence electrons. We don't do that. So that can't be true. So the opposite, something else must be true. This lone pair must be what turns into that bond. So we have a nitrogen with a charge. Rather than counting the electrons or assuming if we have four bonds, something that normally has three, if you have a different number of bonds than normal in general, that means that something changed with the lone pairs, not that you actually moved electrons. Carbocations wind up being the exception to that, but we'll see why when we get there. So what charge would this have, would this nitrogen have? We took this, it has no lone pair anymore. Do you guys remember how to do formal charge? Rob nodded. So he raised his hand. It would be plus one. Plus one? Yeah. Because, so the, remember, our rule for formal charge is you count how many electrons it has on the periodic table when it's neutral. How many valence electrons? So nitrogen would have five on the periodic table when it's neutral. Here, nitrogen only has eight electrons around it, but it's sharing all eight of them. So it really only controls half of those. So it really owns four electrons, but it had five on the per periodic table. So it's lost an electron effectively. It has access to one fewer electrons, even though its valence is built. So a lot of times what we're gonna do in this class is we're just gonna count bonds to figure out what the charge is, something. If nit any nitrogen with four bonds is, has a positive charge. Any oxygen with three bonds has a positive charge. What about an oxygen with one bond? Let's say we had a compound that looked like, we would expect that to be a negative charge, right? Right. So if we had a compound that looked like this. We'll actually draw in all pairs. That carbon has eight electrons, but it owns four of them, so it's neutral like we're used to. Oxygen has one bonded pair and then three lone pairs, so it has access to seven electrons. On the periodic table, when oxygen is neutral, it's got six. One extra electron means that that's a negative charge on that oxygen. And so once we get used to the fact that we're almost always just dealing with the same three atoms for the most part, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, it's pretty easy to just look at the number of bonds it has and assign a charge to it. 
So a lot of, and that's why we can get away with not drawing the lone pairs. We we're actually going to write this um, as, out as a polyatomic ion. We would just write it like that. Once you know the rules and you know our frame of reference and how we define charge and everything, this has all the same information that this one does. If we, as long as we're all working from the same assumptions, full valences, um, and never more than eight electrons on a on a n equals two. All right, so these some of these have charges, but they're not shown. So see if we can figure these um, out. Pull up a periodic table if you don't have one. I'll print some of my my regular periodic tables out so we can just have some floating around since we don't have them on the walls here. First one, or the aluminum. The aluminum is the only one we haven't really talked about yet. Aluminum again does start showing up a little bit. Um, it's a metal which means it typically loses its valence shell, so we still don't really have to worry about a d orbital with aluminum, even though it does have electrons in the n equals three. It's at the bottom end of the n equals three, so it's very rare that you actually get aluminum choice where we have to worry about um, that d orbital. How many electrons does it have on the periodic table? Three, right? One extra electron, so we would expect this to be a negative charge. And we've got an oxygen with three bonds and one pair, more bonds than it wants to. When you're still getting used to it, when you're counting these bonds, I always go back to Okay, oxygen normally makes two bonds. If it's got three bonds, it's sharing more than it wants to. Therefore, it has less electrons, right? So sharing more than normal means that's an oxygen with a positive charge, which makes this one really easy to settle too, right? Anytime you see an oxygen with three bonds, positive charge. How about over here? We've got a couple of choices to look at. <clears throat> yeah, nitrogen's only got two bonds. Normally, it makes three, so it's not sharing as much as normal. It's sharing less than normal, which means more electrons, negative charge. Carbon's okay. Or when I say okay, I mean neutral. Carbons don't really care. They're stable. <laughs> How about down here? Yeah, it's, it's not sharing as much as normal, so it has extra electrons. So that's a, call that a carbanion. Makes anion means negative, right? And so we just throw car on front of things to, to indicate if it's a carbon with a negative charge. And this one that I threw up here, this actually breaks our assumption um, 
when it comes to everything having a full valence. If you have a carbon that doesn't have a full valence for whatever reason and only has three bonds, it's sharing less than normal, but it also doesn't have those lone, that lone pair that it controls on its own, right? So positive charge. So when we do get a carbocation, if we, we don't, um, in, in order to get around having to draw the lone pair every time, you have to make sure you label your carbocation as positive charge because that along with telling us it's positive charge, it tells us that's a carbon that, that has an empty spot in its valence, um, which winds up being a really reactive molecule, but it's also a really common molecule because we have something like oxygen attached to the carbon. It puts, uh, let me draw it right now. Um, if we had an oxygen attached to it and that oxygen carbon bond gets broken by something, um, it would just be the oxygen leaving because it's it's unstable and so it just so it takes off. The electrons are always going to go with the more electronegative element, right? Because if we've got carbon and oxygen sharing toys and oxygen's stronger and oxygen goes home, who's taking the toys? Oxygen, right? And so you wind up with when you break those bonds between carbon and something more electronegative than carbon, you wind up with carbocations, which then immediately turn around and react with something else because they're unstable like this. One other point I was going to make here, I'm sure it'll come back to me later. All right. Um, the other, I guess the other bullet point is just, this is one of the reasons why we're going to be careful. We're not going to draw lone pairs all the time. A lot of times when we draw like reaction mechanisms and we're showing how a reaction actually happens, we'll show the lone pairs. Um, but a lot of times we just don't bother because writing a chart is all you really need. If you write the charge that from that, you can work backward to get how many lone pairs are where. Going back to your um, nomenclature from GenCam, how do you indicate something? How do you indicate verbally that something has a negative charge? It's an anion. Um, if we had, we had this compound, how do you name that? Sodium chloride, right? Why is it chloride and not chlorine? Because it's got a negative charge. So I means a negative charge. Um, so a lot of times we, we wouldn't necessarily call this a nit nitrogen ion or anything like that. Um, we would call this an amide because a nitrogen with a, neg a nitrogen that's neutral in a carbon based system is an amine. So if it has a negative charge, it becomes an amide. So we still are going to use that, that terminology to sort of indicate when you've got that positive or negative charge. Um, like for instance, this ion anion here, if we just had it written as, written out like this, I don't know where it's been. How would we name this? Anybody get any guesses? This is kind of a weird one. Name it like it's a covalent compound, even though it's got a negative charge on it. So hydrogen is usually positive, right? When it's attached to anything more electronegative than it is, right? But hydrogen is the dividing line. Basically, what makes metals versus nonmetals is is it more electronegative or less electronegative than hydrogen? So, a hydrogen attached to an aluminum, hydrogen is more electronegative than the aluminum. So, we'd actually name this as aluminum hydride. And this actually winds up being a really, not common is the wrong word, but a really useful compound in organic chemistry. Lithium aluminum hydride um, because it's really, really reactive. Hydrides in general, if you put them around anything that's more electronegative, 
hydrogens basically give those electrons away for free. So you have anything that wants more electrons around and you put it with something like lithium aluminum hydride, it's going to basically start making new hydrogen covalent bonds so that it can share those electrons, the hydrogen has, that it's not very good at holding on to. And which does also remind me the other point I was going to make. Do we ever have to worry about, when do we have to worry about hydrogen having a charge? It's not the octet rule when we're talking about hydrogen, right? It's just got that first energy level. So how many options are there for the number of electrons hydrogen can have? So yeah, it can be neutral. If you, um, or it can have a positive charge. What's a positive charge on a hydrogen look like? No electrons. Yeah, no electrons, no bond either, right? Because if it makes one bond, that's neutral. If hydrogen has a positive charge, it means it has zero electrons. And then the other option is two electrons for hydrogen by itself, and that's how you get hydrides. And they tend to react really quickly because you put it with anything like an oxygen, and oxygen's gonna snatch those up. And so when we when we draw our charges like this, we want to try to put our charges next to the element that has the charge. But if it happens to be written and you're not sure, oh, if, is that on the oxygen or the hydrogen? We can usually assume that if the hydrogen's attached to something, it doesn't have a positive charge. And the only time it has a negative charge when it's attached to something is when it's attached to a metal. All right, so hydrogen for the most part is not going to have a charge once it's in our molecules. All right, so you played around with some of this in the lab the other day. Um, there are going to be lots of times in OCHEM where it's not enough to just have the, the molecular formula for a compound. It doesn't actually tell us what it is. Um, because in organic chemistry, in all chemistry, but it's really, really obvious in organic chemistry, you can have the same ratio of atoms in the, in the molecule without them being arranged the same way. So if we look at these two, so that's what's called a constitutional isomer. A constitutional isomer means that you have the same atoms, that's what makes it an isomer. So iso is the prefix, right? So is isotope changes the number of neutrons you have in a nucleus. Isomer means we have the same atoms, but arranged differently. Right, so dimethyl ether versus ethanol, they're both C2H6O, but they behave very differently. Ethanol's boiling point is at about 78 Celsius at sea level, dimethyl ether is at minus 23 Celsius. Fun fact, they you can actually buy dimethyl ether at the at the, the pharmacy over the counter. Um, they use it for they package it for treating warts. Used to be if you had a wart, you'd go to the doctor and they would pour liquid nitrogen on it until it throws off. Now they actually package dimethyl ether in a little, it's kind of like an aerosol can um, that you just eject a little bit of that into a little like bubble that you put on your skin. And because it boils at minus 23 Celsius, that's pretty cold. That's cold enough you can give yourself frostbite with that or freeze a wart off with that. It's not as effective as, as liquid nitrogen that boils at about nine, minus 200 Celsius, um, but it's a lot easier to sell over the counter um, and not worry about people you know, really damaging themselves. You really can't get yourself into too much trouble at minus 23 Celsius compared to minus 200 Celsius. Um, and when when you all transfer and get to go take chemistry at other places, um, play with the liquid nitrogen. It's really pretty safe if you know basic lab safety and you can do cool stuff like, like freeze an orange and then take the orange and drop it onto a concrete floor from about here and it shatters. Um, we used to catch lizards with it too um, because you can, uh, lizards are cold blooded, right? If you drop their body temperature, they slow down. So all you have to do is find a lizard with a cup of liquid nitrogen. You throw the liquid nitrogen on the lizard. The lizard just like slowly starts trying to run away. Just walk over and pick it up. Um, 
There's a little lizard. I'm sure it's not pleasant, but they, they run away just fine afterwards. So. All right. So one of the big skills from first quarter OPM is going to be how do we draw relatively stable compounds? They're all going to have different stabilities a little bit. But anything that's got full valence and, and the right number of bonds for all your atoms is going to be relatively stable, close to the same stability usually. So one of the big skills we're going to learn here is how do we think about putting these pieces together differently um, in a way that, that allows us to look at all the possibilities. So we're going to work through these. Um, and after I give you a few seconds to think about them, Think about them. I'm going to tell you how many isomers there are for each of these. And then we're going to work through what they are and how we can tell if they're the same or not. Is what I would recommend is don't worry about the hydrogens until the very end. Draw all of what we call the heavy atoms. Is anything besides a hydrogen? Arrange all the heavy atoms and then see if adding, filling all the valence stuff with hydrogens gives you the right number of hydrogens. get through the first, we attempted the first two or three. If you start to get 
bogged down the other ones. We'll go through one, two, and three, or A, B, and C, and then that might give you some insight how to tackle B and E. I dropped you into the deep end a little bit. I didn't give you a whole lot of insight as to how you could go about doing this. The, the goal is make, give every carbon four bonds, right? Give every nitrogen three, oxygen two, hydrogen or halogen one bond. So that limits our options a little bit. We don't have as much you know, freedom as it seems like we might. Because there's only so many ways we can arrange three carbons. Basically, and, and this is kind of a good general approach for all of these, is figure out how many different combinations there are for your carbons and before you start worrying about where to put a chlorine or where to put an oxygen. Right, because we think of the carbons, this is, because carbon is the most common element we deal with in OCHEM, carbons are going to kind of be the backbone of any of our molecules. They're going to de determine the parent molecule. It's going to be determined by the carbons and how they're arranged. So if we start by arranging carbons, then we can just fill in gaps and see how many possibilities there are. So for this first one, how many ways are there to arrange carbons? Mm -hmm. Or the first one? So we could fill in the rest of these with we could arrange our carbons like that, right? Is there another way we could arrange the carbons? In fact, I'm gonna just I'm gonna even just replace the chlorine. I'm, I'm just gonna treat this like it's C3 H E for now. Because a lot of times with the halogens, they only make one bond it's like the hydrogens. So the halogens, you can think of them basically having to replace a hydrogen with a halogen. So for the sake of just looking at the carbon chain, I'm just gonna replace it with a hydrogen. Is there another way we could arrange the carbons? You can draw it differently. That seems like that would be different, except that we have to remember that these are three-dimensional objects, right? All of these carbons are tetrahedral, and all of these bonds are just single bonds, and single bonds can rotate around however they want. So this carbon and this carbon still have to stay attached to each other. But if we think about this, we, draw this as though it was a tetrahedral shape because it is. If you think about taking these three atoms that are attached to this middle carbon, you can take them and rotate it however we want, right? And if we rotated it, that would all of a sudden make it look like this carbon was down here and the hydrogen was up there. And then it starts looking just like this one. And so when we go to start naming these compounds, we're not going to be worried about whether it's drawn with the carbon spacing up or down or in a straight line. We're going to worry about what is the longest continuous chain of carbons. We're just going to count it. So this has three continuous carbons linked together. So does this. It's just shaped like an apple. It's still three continuous carbons though. So it's the same molecule. 
So that that helps when it comes to how many possibilities we can have, right? Three continuous carbons, no other way that we can we can change that. So, so if it was C3H8, there's only one constitutional isomer. There is no other constitutional isomer for C3H8. But if we're going to replace one of these hydrogens, oh, there it is. <laughs> Back to Linus again. Yeah, he did. Um, I love being hard for my first born to be named Linus after Linus Pauling and Linus from Peanuts, because let's be real, he's the best part of Peanuts. <laughs> if we're going to replace a hydrogen with chlorine, just pick hydrogen and draw it. Okay, so there's one of our constitutional isomers. If we swapped this chlorine with another hydrogen, then we want to say, is that the same compound that we just drew, or is that a new compound? So I'll draw it out here. So if we switched it with one of these other hydrogens, we get the same thing we just talked about, right? But if we draw the chlorine up versus to the right on this far right carbon, it's still attached to the, the end carbon, right? And remember, this is tetrahedral and could rotate around, so we could twist it and wind up with it shaped like that again. So this is the same molecule. That's not an isomer. So what could we do that makes it a different isomer? We can put it on the middle carbon. Now there's no way we could take this and twist it around to get back to here. In order to do that, we actually have to, would have to break a the chlorine off and reattach it to a different carbon. So that's two. So our second constitutional isomer, if we're drawing the complete structure, then we would just go through and finish up add all of our hydrogens. And it's a good double check to make sure you did everything right. The first thing everybody's going to going to start doing is you're not, not going to count the hydrogens anymore because that you always just fill in with the hydrogens. But it's a good way to double check one that you didn't do something dumb like put five bonds on the carbon, and two that it actually is an isomer. Is you better make sure that there's still seven hydrogens once we fill it all in. What about if we put the chlorine? Actually, so traditionally, chlorine, when it's drawn as a um, on three dimensional structures, is drawn as being green. Different elements have different standard colors. Oxygen's always drawn as red, nitrogen's usually drawn as blue. Carbons are black, hydrogens are white. Chlorine is usually drawn green. Any guesses why? That's chlorine gas is green, yeah. Um, so bromine and iodine are both usually drawn as purple because they're both kind of purplish, reddish. Is this an isomer? Why not? Just flipped. Yeah. These are three-dimensional objects, right? Let's not get tied down into thinking about them from left to right. All you have to do is take this molecule and flip it like a pancake, and you get your chlorine over on this side. So that's the same molecule. So our two isomers for A are your chlorine is attached to carbon one, the end of the carbon chain, and your chlorine attached to carbon two, the second carbon in the carbon chain. Carbon attached to carbon three is the same as a cat attached to carbon one. We're just counting from the other side then. All right, so what happens with the second one here? We don't have any chlorines to worry about, which is kind of nice. What possibilities do we have? 
So easiest one to start with is always just take however many carbons you have and put them in a straight line. And then see if there's any way you can rearrange that. You can take one of those and put it somewhere else. And so for the sake of uh, not cluttering up the board too much, since I'm dealing with limited space here, I would still want you to write all your hydrogens for right now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten hydrogens. So good, C4H10. Our other option, if we took this carbon and we attached it here, that's the same molecule still, right? It's still four carbons in a row. That didn't change anything. But if we attach here, now our longest continuous carbon chain is not four in a row anymore, right? And if we change the longest continuous carbon chain, if it's not the same number anymore, it has to be a different molecule. It has to be an isomer or a different molecule at least. If it has the same formula, then it's an isomer as well. And because now all of a sudden we've got three carbons in a row and one carbon attached to the middle carbon. And so this is usually this is what we refer to as a branch. I know I already used that term in the lab, but if you circle your longest continuous carbon chain, any carbons that are outside that circle are a branch. They're not part of the parent molecule. They're in addition to the parent molecule. All right, and so you'll see the fact that we can we had four in a row. Here's our parent molecule for having what's this is called a straight chain alkane. This is a branched alkene with the same formula. All right, so then what if we do with C? Is there, I'm gonna go to a white screen here so we have more work. C5H12. Start with the simple one, right? The simple one's just five in a row. Count your number of uh, hydrogens to make sure. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Bingo, there's one nice spring. Same thing as before, if we take the carbon at the end and we stick it on one of the other carbons. Stick it to the second carbon, we get the same molecule back again, right? So you're never gonna add a single carbon branch on the second carbon because you really just, I guess I shouldn't say never. I don't deal in absolutes, but there has to be something else going on beyond what we've talked about so far um, in order to be, to see that as a different molecule. But we could add it there. Right now, our longest continuous carbon chain is four instead of five, so it's a different molecule. If we go through and add up all of our hydrogens, three, six, nine, and 11, 12. So we still got our same formula. What's the last one? We have three carbon chains, a uh, central branch, like two curves coming on. And if we had three carbons in a row, now we have two branches that we can add. We can't add them to the ends because then we get back what we started with. But if we put both of them attached to the middle, once again, we have five carbons in a row, four carbons in a row, three carbons in a row. So it's got to be a different molecule. But it's still one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So it's still C5H12.
Would it be a different molecule if you took that uh, one of those carbons and put it like on top of that top one? If you took the bottom one and moved it to the very top? So like there? Yeah. That's what I did. What's your longest continuous carbon chain? Now it's four still. So that's just another way of drawing this one. But that's what I always go back to our, our go to for seeing if what the parent molecule is, is count your longest continuous carbon chain and don't think linearly. Right? Linearly in organic chemistry means follow a chain of bonds, not left to right. All right, with that in mind, did anybody get to get answers they're confident in for um, D and E? Or you want to, now that we've done some practice, why don't you guys look at D and E? Um, and let's say, uh, let's tie that into break. So let's come back at five after, and we'll go through D and E. I put those up there as a guess for how many. I'm doing this in my head and I am resting. So if you think that there's more, by all means, let me know. And then we'll figure out if that's just another way of drawing the same one you already had or not. Thanks. Thanks for the, the, forgot about the universe. 
Are you satisfied with your in your work? Go ahead and take a break to feel free to wander around or whatever. It's really like that. <laughs> yeah, so let's give you a break and do something else for a little bit. <laughs> give, give us the opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> I have bagels downstairs. Anyone yeah. somewhere here? Yeah, there probably are some more bagels. And there will be some lunch. I don't know what's on the docket for lunch today, but there will be lunch at noon too. Yeah. Whole first week of breakfast and lunch all week. Don't be late though. If they ran out of pizza on Monday. You know if they plan on reopening the cafeteria at all? They have to at some point because they're building they're building dorms. And so that means they have to have food for the people living in the dorms that might not have transportation, right? Um, so I know they're planning on it, but I don't know what the hours are going to be or what the timeline for that looks like. But we are trying to get, they did put in like a high-end vending machine that has like fruit rather than candy in it. Yeah. Um, down there by where the old coffee shop was, um, and a coffee machine instead of the coffee shop that'll do you know lattes and whatnot too. Um, Cost just as much to get in a Starbucks, but yeah. on campus at least. Yeah. But they did. I know they did get. You know they've been doing food trucks a lot too, so that there's food on campus because the, uh, they got. I had to go through like a certification process or get a, a permitting process from the city um, to get us classified as a place that food trucks are allowed to come serve food. Um, and apparently, they don't just want food trucks like pulling up on a patch of dirt somewhere and and, and uh, selling food there. Um, but they did that, so now I think after this first week, they're going to go back to um, try to have at least one food truck a day around lunchtime. Uh, parked out. Usually they park out by the, the gym. That's nice when they do that for finals week. Yeah. Yeah. I think they're going to, they did that most of the summer and they're going to try and do that. I think that's going to be like the best option we have mm -hmm. um, until we get the cafeteria reopened. It's going to be that. So I think they're, they're trying to do that at least the busiest days of the week, which are Tuesday, Thursday, I think. Okay. That's cool. They try to do. Yeah. We're, we're aware that there's no food on campus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got to eat too. Yeah. Right. Especially with the bookstore closed, at least I could count on like the Snickers or something there before. But now it's just my packet of ramen that I have in my office is is my option on campus. Peter's got it figured out though. He's got his whole lunchbox every day. He's eating well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he had a lot of fun. He had out all summer and did um and worked with uh, Mario on that. I think I mentioned on our lab manual. Um, they're testing something again. There's a, you guys did the clove oil extraction, I think you said, right? On in At the end of Gen Chem. Did you guys do that one or not? So there's two ways you can do it. The traditional way is you take, you take an herb or a spice, you grind it up and you soak it in water and then you boil the water and you collect the, the steam that comes off. And mostly the, the oils don't dissolve in water very well, but anytime water evaporates, it brings a little bit of the oil with it. So if you collect like a hundred milliliters of the, they call it the distillate, the, the liquid at the end of the distillation, if you collect a hundred milliliters of that, there might be one milliliter of oil in it. So it's not all that efficient, but those oils are really, really strong smelling. So it's, you can definitely know if you've got product or not, it's by just smelling the, the flask. Um, the other way to do it is, is to actually do an extraction with a non-polar solvent um, because a lot of these oils dissolve really, really well in non-polar solvents because they're non-polar molecules. Um, the problem is most non-polar solvents are also really, really toxic to humans. Um, this is actually the same way they used to decaffeinate coffee because they would grind up or they would take the coffee beans, soak them in a non-polar solvent, and then the non-polar solvent would carry off most of the caffeine with it and you'd be left with decaffeinated coffee, um, but it also carried away flavor compounds and you could never 100% get rid of the residue that was left from those solvents. There's always a little bit of dichloromethane left over in the decaf coffee. Um, so now what they've done instead though, is there's, there is a non-polar solvent um, that you can use. It's totally non-toxic, um, but it doesn't exist at atmospheric pressure. You have to go to high pressures. You use CO2 as a solvent. 
Um, so we actually have a lab procedure where we use CO2 as a solvent, take dry ice, mix it with our herbs, our crushed up herbs or spices, cap it um, really, really tightly in a tube that allows it to get up to about four atmospheres, I think is about where CO2 will start showing up as a liquid. And then all of a sudden you've got liquid CO2, CO2 is nonpolar, will carry off all that stuff that normally would dissolve in dichloromethane, will dissolve in CO2, and then CO2 evaporates really, really easily. And even if it doesn't, CO2 is non-toxic. So we have a lab procedure that does that, but it's always been hit or miss, um, depending on what the, we use centrifuge tubes, which are designed to keep pressure in in one direction, but not at the top where you screw it on. So they sent us some with different lids. So Cody and Mario are back to the drawing board to see if they can make it work with this new shipment of centrifuge tubes um, without, because what usually happens with them is they just break, you pop the top off like a champagne cork um, and lose all of your, your CO2 build up. But uh, yeah, it's, that's a fun one though, because it's really satisfying because you just see like a tiny little bubbling start happening. Um, and you see your, your, your dry ice actually melting into a liquid instead of just into a gas. You actually get that to work right. It's, it's very satisfying, at least for me. Um, but, and OCHEM in general, labs up here, all uh, are very hit or miss. You didn't think it actually has a really big effect on OCHEM labs more than GenChem labs because we do a lot of stuff where we set up our glassware and then we add our reactants into a solvent and then we boil our solvent for 40 minutes. Um, well, our boiling points of everything are so much lower here, or significantly lower, that that means our times have to be shifted upward. And there are a few experiments where just doing it for twice as long even still doesn't get you to as much product as if you had been able to do it at 10 degrees higher temperature. Um, and so that one, we're going to have, we will have some labs, especially with a group like this, or this size, I mean, um, we will have some labs where maybe one of the groups gets a positive result. We'll have some labs where nobody gets a positive result. We go through the process and at the end, we try to get our product and we get nothing. Um, that's part of the nature of being up here and being in a small class and being at altitude is we have to deal with that and kind of make some adjustments on the fly. But that's one of the reasons why I wrote this lab manual is so that, and had Cody and Mariola run through most of the labs is make sure that they can make it work. Um, so we can get rid of most of the ones that just don't work for us. But I'm sure there will still be a few, there always is. All right. What do we get for this, for part D? What are our two possibilities for our uh, carbon structure? Similar to what we had over here, right? Still four carbons. So if we have all, all of our carbons linked together, there's two ways we can arrange them, right? What we still have, we have an oxygen. So both of these, we have 10 more bonds, right? So if it was just C4H10, we'd fill them all up with hydrogens and we'd be done, right? That goes to C4H10O. And how many bonds does oxygen want to make? Two, right? So we're not just replacing a hydrogen with something else. We're replacing a hydrogen with an oxygen, which then is attached to something else because we need two bonds, right? So the easiest way to do that is have an OH group, functional group that we call an alcohol that we'll talk about um, functional groups here in a few minutes. 
Um, but now we can just treat this off this OH group like we did with the halogen, right? An OH group is going to replace one of the hydrogens instead of a fluorine replacing one of the hydrogens. So with that in mind, how many different places are there to put an OH group on this carbon on, on this molecule on the left? And it's two, right? We can put we can add an OH there. Or we can add an OH here. Could we put one on the third carbon? Second. Same thing as putting on the second carbon, right? Until we start adding other stuff on, these two carbons are identical. We could start counting either end and still they're the second carbon, right? And same for these ones at the end, right? When the OH on this last carbon is the same as putting it on the first carbon. It's at the end of the carbon chain either way. So we have two possibilities to have four carbons in a row. What about over here? How many possibilities are there here? Well, you could put it there. Put it on the central carbon. Is that a different molecule than putting it here though? Still three carbons is our longest continuous carbon chain with the OH at the end. It's just that you start counting from down here instead of counting from over here. So really there's putting it at the end of the chain or putting it on the middle. And this is the same as the end of the chain. There's three ends to the chain now. So that gets us to four possibilities, right? Those are the four that I was thinking of when I first wrote that number up there. It needs to be consistent. I should change colors for the second one here. There's two ways we can arrange all of our carbons, and each of those has two places, two distinct carbons where you could add an OH or replace a hydrogen with an OH. Careful with thinking about it as adding an OH because that gets you into drawing carbons with five bonds if you're not careful. Replace a hydrogen with an OH. The other possibility, it might actually be as many as, no, it shouldn't be. Wait, it might be seven, it might be one more. The other possibility is oxygen wants to make two bonds, right? So what if instead of having an oxygen and, and to a hydrogen, if we put the oxygen in between two carbons, it's a functional group called an ether, and ethers, there's a couple of ways we can, we can do this now. We can say, okay, well, I'm gonna draw my carbon chain, but I'm gonna put the oxygen in the middle of it. We still have our longest continuous carbon chain is three now. We can't have an ether with the longest continuous carbon chain of four with this formula, right? Because you can't break it. If you're gonna have an ether, if you're gonna have an oxygen attached to two carbons, one of our four carbons at least has to be on the other side of the oxygen, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. So we still got the right formula. You could put two carbons on one side and then the oxygen and then two carbons on the other side. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That one's diethyl ether. That's the ether that you think of when you think of ether as an anesthetic or if you're in loathing. That's diethyl ether. Um, pretty good at knocking people out for a little bit and 
dissociating their consciousness from their physical body. Um, not great for surgery because it's really unpredictable how long somebody will be under. So during the Civil War, there was lots of stories of surgeons working on amputating somebody's limb and then waking up in the middle of it. Um, even this is potentially scarier is them coming to and being aware of being operated on, but not able to move their arms and legs. So their you know, brain in a jar trapped. Um, plus, uh, it also causes nausea. And, and as my OCHEM professor used to say when we went through this history lesson, um, vomiting is bad for stitches. So uh, we don't use that very much anymore, at least not with that. You know, we use it sometimes in conjunction with other anesthetics, use it to start the process and then something longer lasting um, through an IV. Is there another ether? Could you do like a three carbon chain and then the uh, oxygen coming out of the middle? Yeah, so the way we name these typically is we think of this as the branch. We could take that branch and we could put it on this carbon instead of on the end carbon. So the last possibility, call this a methoxy group. We could put the methoxy group on the middle carbon instead of on the end carbon. So we could have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Can't do that with this one though, right? Because we moved it to the other carbon. Our ethoxy group is just on, we start counting from the other side now. But you can see how the more the more carbons you have, and the more distinct atoms you have, the number of possible isomers goes up exponentially for the most part, right? The more degrees of freedom you have, the more ways you can arrange things within our constraints of everything with the right number of bonds. Um, we're not going to consider anything like where if, if we had taken away a hydrogen from one of these carbons and put it on the oxygen to get the oxygen three bonds to the carbon three bonds, that's not considered a stable isomer because we have two unstable ions right next to each other. If there's a way to arrange things so that nothing has a charge, that's always gonna be more stable than arranging it so that two things in the same molecule have opposite charges. What we find out is if we do that, things generally rearrange themselves into the state. If you put a positive charge next to a negative charge, they'll wind up moving things around to become more stable. Well, uh, the letting the molecule relax, it will relax into the more stable state on its own if we were able to make it in the first place. That's seven. I think that's seven, three ethers and the four alcohol, alcohols, four OHs. It's a lot easier when you don't have to consider the ethers. So we usually ask this question on a test. I'd be way more likely to ask this question for any of the other four of these um, rather than this one, because when you have to switch frames of thinking for thinking about OHs to thinking about ethers in the middle of the problem, um, it's easy to get tripped up there. And that's not usually what I'm after when I'm asking test questions under stress. Situation, homework question, yes. Take home part of the test, sure. That can still be easy probably for the take home part of the test, um, but not, if I did, I would be grading it like get, get four out of a possible seven and I would tell you there were seven or something like that um, as a way to not let your stress uh, run you into a lower grade. All right, last one. We already did, we looked at three carbons in a row, right? Only one way to arrange three carbons in a row. Now we've got to replace two of our hydrogens with chlorines. You could do a chlorine here. So if it was just, it would go back to A, 
we could put chlorine on the end or chlorine in the middle, right? So there's two possibilities if there's only one chlorine. If there's two chlorines, though, put a chlorine on either end. What else can we do? Two, two on one end, or one on the middle, one on the end. And the trick with this, and we've been going fast on this one, but let's go back and make sure we didn't do anything. So that's six hydrogens. Six hydrogens. One, two, three, four, five, six hydrogens. Where you can get yourself in trouble going too fast is to stick both carbons or both chlorines on the middle carbon that can, can't make that many bonds. Like if there was a methyl group on this carbon and then you tried to add two chlorines to it as well, we all of a sudden we've got a carbon with five bonds. So that's why drawing the hydrogens or at least going back and checking if you, even if you're doing a skeletal structure uh, is really helpful to make sure you didn't do that. Two, three, four, five, six. Any others? We've got one way that we can have chlorines on opposite ends. There's only one way we can arrange that, right? Because there's only two ends to a chain. We can have them adjacent to each other. And there's only, with only three carbons, there's only one, one way that they can be adjacent to each other, right? If this was four carbons long, they could be adjacent to the end or adjacent to the middle. So that would get, it made, so there's more possibilities. And then they could be on the same carbon. And if they're on the same carbon, they could be on the same carbon at the end or the same carbon on the middle. And again, anytime you think that there's a one more, especially if you can keep it more organized than I have it here, I'm constrained by the space and trying not to erase things too much here. Um, if you think there's another option, draw it and then see if you can twist things around if it's really the same as what you had before. Um, and actually, when we get good at naming things, that's actually naming them is the easiest way. Because if you name it and come up with the same name as something you already did, that means it's the same molecule if you named it properly. Right? So that's actually sort of a the nomenclature has a built in checklist of ways things can be different from each other. This should all more or less feel like review, but like a little bit trickier than maybe we saw in, at the end of Gen Chem, or at the very least, like good practice to get back in the swing of things, right? All right, we talked about Linus Pauling a little bit. We talked about, he was one of the one, I think, I can't remember who came up with this graph first. Um, basically, this is a, a chart that looks at um, how stable or unstable something is if you have two hydrogen atoms, so neutral, each one with a one vacancy in their valence shell. If you start with them and then the, the um, x-axis is distance between the two nuclei. If you start with those hydrogens an infinite distance apart, you don't have a bond, they're too far apart. But the, even in, if there was no other interactions, if the entire universe was just those two hydrogen atoms an infinite distance apart, there is some attractive force. The force, if, if this is energy, the force attracting or repelling things, you can think of that as the slope of this line. Like, if you think of these two hydrogens as ball bearings put on this surface an infinite distance apart, there's still going to be a tiny little bit of slope. And that tiny little bit of slope will draw them closer to each other. And as they get closer, you start to see these orbitals overlapping. The slope decreases, right? So you have more force. They're drawn to each other faster. Until they reach some average distance from each other, where you get as much overlap between those two orbitals as possible, but what happens when you start going back this way? Yeah, what, what's going to cause that? 
Yeah, the nuclei have, have positive charges, right? So the electrons are drawn together to try and fill the valences. But if you get too close together, then those two nuclei are going to wind up pushing, pushing each other apart. And this is, this is just looking at the electromagnetic potential energy. This is, in chemistry, we get the luxury of ignoring the gravity, which the physicists don't like, because that's their favorite. Um, when you first learn physics, is everything's about gravity. Um, this is ignoring what would happen if we got those two nuclei really, really close together. Something's going to blow up. You get a fusion reaction. Um, if you get those two nuclei so that they actually are touching, now all of a sudden they're not two nuclei, they're one nucleus, which all of a sudden means this red line, you know, nose dives because it actually becomes more stable, especially if there's a neutron involved. But even, even with just the two protons, you can see that that fusion reaction happening. But again, Chemistry mainly concerns itself, especially OCHEM, mainly just worried about electromagnetic forces. We don't deal with fusion or fission, which are your strong and weak nuclear force, and we don't deal with gravity. So all we're looking at is the electronic forces. All right, so this is what causes covalent bonds. Is and why every bond is going to have its own unique sort of distance. You have different atoms. If we change the charge on one of these nuclei, this bond length is going to change, right? Because now all of a sudden, if, if there's a plus two charge here and a plus two charge there, those are going to repel each other more than, than if it was plus one and plus one, right? So it's going to have a different bond length. If you change whether we're talking about 1s or, um, orbitals or 2s orbitals, that's going to change how big these clouds are, right? So every different type of covalent bond is going to have its own unique bond that's based on the charge of the protons and those nuclei and what electron or what orbitals are actually doing the bonding. Right? And so what, what actually winds up happening um is we wind up when we get those orbitals overlapping like we see here so orbitals we represent them as probability clouds and think about them as waves right what happens when you have two waves run into each other then you get the wave double the size of the original right so that's what we call constructive interference and so if you happen to have two Atomic orbitals, like an oxygen's s orbital and a hydrogen's s orbital, or sorry, an oxygen's p orbital and a hydrogen's s orbital. If we get them close enough to each other, those two orbitals wind up overlapping, and we get a new shape that's based on the constructive interference of the two other functions. And so, orbitals. I also want to remind you, I have two phases usually. Um, where those nodes occur, it switches phase, but don't think of that phase as um, one electron is in the green part and one electron is in the blue part. And you can't even think of it in terms of positive and negative charge. It is a, a sign that switches from positive to negative, but it's not charge. It's basically is the wave up or down. Right? And so the green is, we can think of the green as having the wave be up. And so when green with green, you get constructive interference. And the blue is when the wave is down. And so if you try if you try to overlap the blue portion of this orbital with the green S orbital, a bond doesn't form you get destructive interference instead. They cancel each other out. Um, which is one of the things that's really tricky about quantum in general is we deal with positives and negatives in lots of different variables. Positive and negative in the sense of orbital phase has nothing to do with charge. It's its own thing. Um, when, you, when you think of, or if you've heard of um, like string theory has, says there's 11 dimensions that define objects, things like that. Dimension is just another way of saying variable. Position is still defined in string theory as being X, Y, Z in time. But then 
There's also, well, is it positively charged or negatively charged? Is it in phase or out of phase? Those are all actually, you can think of them as being different dimensions um, that you could have where different particles have different properties, um, which is not a perfect way of thinking about some of those uh, theoretical physics, but it's how they get to things like there's nine dimensions. Um, it's not like they're nine spatial dimensions. There are nine different qualities that these particles can have. Uh, so here's just a picture of, um, of what you get when you have anti-bonding orbitals, which is when you have them try to, you try to overlap orbitals that are out of phase with each other. You get that destructive interference and it's the opposite of a bond. It's less stable than not making a bond at all. It's higher in energy. And so we'll talk about anti-bonding orbitals to some extent in the in the future. Um, when we start talking about bonds breaking and bonds forming, turns out in order to break a covalent bond, you need to start giving electron density to the anti-bonding orbital. You need to start adding electrons. So for instance, if you started adding electrons into this green area over here, that's putting electron density into the anti-bonding orbital, which sort of cancels out the bonding. It already has electrons in the bonding. That looks like this. But if you started adding electron density to the anti-bonding orbital, then the bond starts weakening. And if you have just as much electron density in the anti-bonding orbital as the bonding orbital, the bond breaks. And instead, you wind up forming a new bond with whatever was coming in and adding electron density over here was basically putting electron density into its bonding orbital at the expense of putting electrons into the anti-bonding orbital for the other molecule. So it's basically all of these different functions sort of overlapping and adding on each other is how reactions happen. And it changes the shape. This looks like an average P orbital. This looks like an S orbital but it doesn't behave like either of them once you mix them together. You get that new function that's really part S orbital, part P orbital instead. And that's that process called hybridization. So this is just going into what we talked about the other day, where it said, well, if all bonds are is partially filled orbitals overlapping with other partially filled orbitals, carbon should only be able to make two bonds. And we know that's not the case. Even in the, this would have been probably like the 1920s or so they were figuring this out. Um, and so, the, well, we know that methane is relatively stable and that's CH4 and carbon four bonds. So our valence bond theory doesn't accurately predict that. So we wind up having to make adjustments, right? Chemistry is a series of, we're going to teach you the general way to think about things, and then next year we're going to teach you why that's wrong and get you more, um, more accurate picture as we go. So in order to model that, they added linear algebra. They took these functions, these orbitals in the form of functions, and they basically mixed them together in a matrix. Um, where you said, okay, well, the value that's in this spot in the matrix, that's how much of a weight we're putting on the one S. And the value on this point in the matrix, this is how much of a weight we're putting on the two S. We basically mix them together in different amounts to try and get the most stable possible state. And so that is that is what those hybridized molecular orbitals are. I found this one too. I thought that was useful. It'd be better if you can see what it says at the bottom, but that's the years of academy training wasted. <laughs> um, and that will continue. We'll keep doing that. I'll try to set you up for the next level, but it's always going to be a case of, wait, I learned it this way. You're telling me that that's wrong? No, I'll just, I'll just simplify it. Um, go. All right. So what you've got instead, in order to get that carbon to able to make four bonds, is we said, well, what if we take these P orbitals in this 2S orbital and we mix them together and get that new sort of a function where instead of having 
a 2p and a 2s, we get all of them the same energy. Now there's four that are degenerate. And if there are four orbitals that are the same in energy, then that means that if we're following that octet rule and then um, set Hun's rule, where you fill all of them up with one electron before you double anything up, right? Now we have four partially filled orbitals that can each make a bond. And that has the added benefit of matching what we saw with, like, with the molecular geometries because these new sp3 orbitals naturally arrange their, themselves pointed in a tetrahedral shape. When you mix all these things together, the different ways you have of mixing them together arrange in a tetrahedral shape on their own. Mathematically, that's, that's how it works. And it just so happens that also matches what we think about with Vesper geometries with the furthest apart these electrons can be from each other and still be attached to the same central carbon is a tetrahedral shape. Funny how all the math actually works out together sometimes instead of contradicting each other. Um, and so when we call this an sp3 orbital, what we're really saying is that, is that it's a hybridized orbital that we mix together. This sp3 is telling you Okay, one part S and three parts P. There's your S, there's your three parts P. If you ever have an orbital, if you have an uh, atom that doesn't have four bonds or four electron groups taking up space, usually that means that one of these P orbitals isn't hybridized, isn't mixed in with it, either because it's making a pi bond, a double bond with something else, or because it's empty you can wind up with an sp2 orbital. So for instance, that boron, that BH3 we talked about, and I said, and I said, well, this violates our rules because boron doesn't have full valence, right? There's just not enough electrons for BH3 to have full valence. Well, that means that instead of having its third part of its p orbital mixed in with the s orbital, that empty P orbital just stays there empty. If we're not going to use it, why mix it in? So anytime you get only three electron groups around your central atom, it's an sp2. Um, and if it's a double bond, and again, we're going to use these terms, sigma bonds are a single bond. It's just this, what we normally think of when we get these things overlapping with each other. If you try to make a double bond, a double bond is going to be weird because we go back to that water molecule from a few slides ago. If you try to make a double bond and this is what your single bond looks like, you have to have a physical space to put those other two electrons that are making the double bond, right? So they can't just be in the same space as the single bond. So sigma bonds look like they're, they're rotationally um, symmetrical. They're just, the electrons are in between the two nuclei. Your pi bonds are what you get when you make a, a what they call a higher order bond, because it's not just for double bonds. And that's when you get something that looks like this. To make a pi bond, we need unhybridized orbitals, unhybridized p orbitals, in order to make that pi bond. So when we think what we think of as a double bond is actually two bonds that are not the same as each other. A, a double bond is a sigma bond that would be right between these two carbons, where the marker is, plus the pi bond that's above and below. And in order to make those pi bonds, you need unhybridized p orbitals. All right. If we so hybridization is kind of a tricky concept. Um, it it really really telegraphs one to one with thinking about how many electron groups are around an atom. 
If you can count the number of electron groups around an atom, just from the formal or from the um, Lewis dot structure, just like you did when you did all your Vesper geometries back in Gen Chem, count how many things are taking up space around that atom. And that tells you the hybridization. If there's three things taking up space, like this carbon, has the other carbon atom taking up space around it, and then it has a hydrogen taking up space, and it has a hydrogen taking up space. Really, it has that the sigma bond to each of those two hydrogens. Three electron groups means that we have to mix together three orbitals to get there. One s orbital, two p orbitals. Right, so if it's tetrahedral, if it's got four electron groups around that central atom, it's always sp3. So sp3, tetrahedral, four electron groups are all different ways of saying the same thing. And I remember being really confused by hybridization and just not wanting to think about it, um, but it's really just different language to describe stuff you guys are already pretty good at, at doing. Right? So what do we get if we only have two electron groups? So let's say we have carbon dioxide. This Lewis dot structure looks like this. How many electron groups are there around each of the oxygens? So remember that those pi bonds still have to be pointed in the same direction as the sigma bond, right? So for the sake of how many things are taking up space around the, the um, oxygen, the sigma bond and the pi bond count as one group. They're bigger than the other two groups. They'll take up more space physically, but roughly speaking, it's all in the same spot. So only three things taking up space. So it's, it's electron geometry would be the term for something where you've got three things taking up space, not tetrahedral, it's, it's planar, it's trigonal planar. What's its hybridization? It's got three sigma bonds, it's got three um, things taking up space, so it has to have three bonds or three orbitals mixed together. One part S, two parts P. And you're never going to have a hybridized orbital that's P3 without the S, because you're always going to mix in the lowest energy orbitals first. So it's going to be S, and then however many P pieces you need to get to the number of electron groups. So for the oxygens here, that's SP2 and SP2. How many electron groups are there here? Just two, right? So what's the hybridization going to be here? We don't need this one. We don't even need that one. It's just SP. And people people don't usually say SP1, but nobody's going to really correct you. If you say SP1, everybody still knows what you're talking about. But, but yeah, they might chuckle a little bit. When I say, oh, that's a chemistry undergrad. That's okay. There are worse things to be. <laughs> All right. So, what is the hybridization on any hydrogen atom? S. Just S. They don't hybridize, they only have one S orbital. Right? They don't have any P orbitals they can mix in. If we had something that had five electron groups, like I can do this off the top of my head. Uh, SF4. Leave its structure. Looks like that. Five electron groups. We have to start mixing in a D orbital. We only have three pieces of a P orbital we can add. If we need to make five electron groups, we need a D orbital. This is once again, going back to, you will never see a carbon with five things around it because there's no D orbital we can mix in to make it happen. 
And like I said before, we're just going to not deal with the orbits for the most part. We go to tetrahedral and stop there for this class for the most part. So as long as you're hanging on to SP, SP2, SP3, you, you can get there just by counting how many things are there attached. What's the molecular geometry for the, the electron geometry? And it also means every heavy atom, every atom that's bigger than a hydrogen is going to have a hybrid in its own hybridization in a molecule. So one of your quiz questions this weekend is going to be just like this. It'll be a different molecule, but it's just go through what's the hybridization on each of these. And all you have to do is if you have a complete structure, it's really easy. That's a carbon with four things attached to it. It's got to be sp3. Four bonds to a carbon, all single bonds, it's got to be sp3. sp2, it's got a pi bond, so it has an unhybridized p orbital to make that pi bond. So it's sp2 and sp2. sp3, sp. SP and a hydrogen. And the other reason that, that we don't use more logic for why SP is the way that it is, um, in order to make a pi bond, you had to have two, so a sig bond is going to look like that, probably, right? Where they overlap, that's where you get the bond. Pi bonds can't do that. They have to go above and below. So you can make a double bond. It's going to look like this. Really, these sort of smoosh together. You wind up with something that looks kind of more like a, like a new shape or like a, a balloon animal balloon between the two. If you're going to make a third bond, it's also a pi bond. But it can't be here. It can't be up and down. It has to be in and out. Right? And so that's why it's SP is now to make a, pi, a second pi bond on the same carbon. We need another unhybridized set P orbital in order for that to happen. Otherwise, we don't have a way we can make this shape, right? So it's just one more say, way of saying it's going to be sp because the other two pieces of the p orbital are occupied making that second or first and second pi bonds, um, and that's why we, we refer to them as sigma bonds and pi bonds rather than talking about it's a double bond like it's one object. A double bond is two bonds, but they're not identical. There's the sigma bond part and the pi bond part, and they react differently. Sigma bonds are a lot stronger than pi bonds because there's a lot more overlap here. So that's harder to break. These, we kind of have to use our imagination and see what it would look like overlapping because they're not really that close together, right? They're not pointed the same direction. Um, if I was trying to draw that second pi bond coming out of the board and into the board, we usually draw it something like this. And so we wind up with, again, that's other shape. And that's really messy really quick, right? Which is why having multiple colors is helpful drawing this or showing it on a three-dimensional computer program where we can click and drag around. Um, by the way, those orbitals in 3D where you can click and drag around like the, the water molecule orbitals we were looking at earlier, that's what my grad school research was using is that program that basically runs through all these different orbital shapes, mixes them together and experimentally finds which it's or numerically finds which one's the most stable by looking at this has lower energy than everything else around it. Um, and from that, you can figure out what molecular, the shapes of the molecules actually are going to be, as well as where are they reactive? Um, what wavelengths of light are they likely to absorb? Because you can look at how what the difference in energy is between these compounds by looking at what happens when we actually mix these things together and what is the what do the numbers look like 
So I actually made those figures for one of, for one of my first job interviews was teaching one of my first teaching jobs out of grad school was teaching OCHEM. And I used those figures because I was fresh out of grad school at the time. And, and it was really, really straightforward to throw those figures together. Um, and I still think they look pretty good if you ask me, but I'm partial. All right. Um, let's, we've been talking about, this is all review for Vesper. There's a better picture of two pylons forming. Yeah, all right, so if we make a pi bond, would we expect the carbons to be the same distance apart as if we just had a sigma bond? Would they be further apart, closer? Probably closer, why? More of an attraction, more sharing of electrons. We can't get these p orbitals close, physically close enough to each other that they, they can actually overlap to some extent, right? So in order to make that pi bond, we actually have to compress that spring in between these two carbons a little bit more than it normally would be. Um, and so this is actually what the electrons look like, the valence electrons look like for this is acetylene. You can see why acetylene burns so well and so easily is because those pi bonds are just not that stable. It's really, really easy when you expose it to oxygen and a little bit of heat to get them to release all of that energy very quickly. And when you do that with pi bonds, it also winds up producing enough energy that you break carbon-carbon bonds because carbon-oxygen saving bonds are stronger, are more stable because the oxygen is more stable and it's more electronegative. So acetylene is a really useful gas for a number of reasons, partly because it burns so completely and so hot because of that. So if you form a pi bond between two nuclei, will it be easier to break them apart, harder to break them apart? Same. The sigma bond is about the same, but now you have to put in, whereas before you only had to put enough energy to break the sigma bond, now you have to put enough energy to break the pi bond and the sigma bond. And the pi bond, yeah, it's not as strong as the sigma bond, so it's not like it takes twice as much energy, but it takes like one and a half times as much energy. It's a little bit more than that. I think it's like 1.8 times as much. You get 0.8 times as much energy stability out of a pi bond compared to the sigma bond. Um, but you can actually count number of pi bonds. So for this case, going from one pi bond to two pi bonds, the sigma bond is roughly the same strength to break. Both pi bonds are the same as each other. So that one actually does map to not double, but the difference between a single bond to a double bond and a double bond to a triple bond, those distances are the same. If that makes sense. Um, and we can actually look at this, one of the textbooks, not the textbook we're using this year, but one of the uh, older textbook that I was using has these bond lengths. You can see as we add more pi bonds, they get closer together. And the bond total bond energy goes from 368 kilojoules per mole to 632, so not quite double, and 632 to 820. The, the difference between these two and these two is what I was talking about. Those ones are roughly the same. Not identical, but close. Does anybody know what this is? Angstroms. You almost got there. It's just a convenient distance. It's not nanometers. It's nanometers is meter times 10 to the minus nine. This is meters times 10 to the minus 10. So basically it's a 10th of a nanometer, but it's really convenient for chemists because most covalent bonds are right around one angstrom. So rather than dealing in tenths of a nanometer or a hundred picometers, we just define our own length unit as, as an angstrom. <clears throat> All right, um, electronegativity and polarity. I'm trying to think. All right, so I want to talk real quick. Since we're almost done. Uh, we didn't get to talking about functional groups, um, but it, it is on the quiz. And I'm going to leave it on there because it's something that's pretty straightforward to learn what some of these different functional groups look like and identify them. 
it's like flashcard level. And so it's open book. So you'd be able to look these up pretty easily. But basically all a functional group is, is when you have a certain group of atoms that share a common characteristic. So for instance, this molecule and this molecule and this molecule all have different formulas, different boiling points, everything else. But what they share is they each have a carbon-carbon pi bond. And a single carbon-carbon pi bond is called an alkene. That is a functional group. So it's really, it's the fact that you've got a carbon-carbon, a single carbon-carbon pi bond makes it a, this distinct functional group. Having an OH, an OH group attached to um, a carbon chain, regardless of what that carbon chain is. So a lot of times if we have, we just want a placeholder in organic chemistry, um, we'll use R because it's not an element. R just means some of the carbons. Um, so whatever you've got an OH attached to, the OH group is a functional group called an alcohol. Right. And so I'll make sure that it's posted, but there's a, a compound chemistry poster that has all of these in really nice, deep, easy to, um, to look at forms. But basically, what I want you to do is start to get familiar with what are the names of some of these common functional groups, like an alcohol, like an alkene. We're going to go through and define and you learn how to name stuff that fits into these functional groups later. But for now, it really makes our life a lot easier to communicate in lecture and in lab, if we can say it's an alcohol group, even if you don't know what the whole molecule looks like, right? Because it allows us to point to, to one part of the molecule and say, that's where it's gonna happen, or that's what's making it polar. And so in the, the poster that I'm talking about, um, basically the way that the, um, the quiz question is going to work is it's just, I just screen grabbed the circled parts of these, just like this, and it's just fill in the blank. Is this what I gave you? Is it alkane or is it something else? And so it's, um, yeah. you can see there's the R groups, like I was talking about. If you have a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, at the end of a carbon chain, it's an aldehyde. If you have a carbon double bonded to an oxygen in the middle of a carbon chain, so an R group on each side, that's a ketone. So it's just a matter of using this figure and sort of, it's just matching to what the figure is. And we'll talk about properties of all these. We'll gradually add in, basically every functional group has a chapter in the textbook. And it's like, okay, ketones, here's how you name them, here's how they behave, here's how they react, and here's how you can make them. And then we'll add, and then beyond ketones, there's aldehydes. <laughs> They're mostly the same with a few differences. We're just going to keep building. We're going to start with alkenes and alkynes. Um, and it's actually, we're going to start with alkanes, which means no pi bonds at all. Right? And that's time. But there's one more thing that I wanted to say, um, just when it comes to these constitutional isomers uh, and talking about alkanes versus alkenes. Um, the key to knowing if you have to worry about rings or pi bonds when it comes to how many constitutional isomers you can make is how many other things are attached to the carbons. And it follows what's called the 2n plus 2 rule. Basically, if you put, if n is your number of carbons, it's saturated, meaning it can't hold any more hydrogens if for five carbons, you have 12 hydrogens. Right? And you get that by taking that five, plugging it in to the N, two times five is 10 plus two, <laughs> means we can have 12 sigma bonds to those carbons. Every time you add a, a ring or a pi bond, you're going to lose two hydrogens. You're going to lose two sigma bonds that the carbon could make to other, other things. Right? So if, when we're looking at those formulas, the molecular formula itself will tell you if you have to worry about pi bonds or rings 
in your in your constitutional isomers here. Um, different possible structures. I just wanted to, you may have seen that in Gen Chem, you may not have, um, but that's just a good rule of thumb. If you look at how many hydrogens there are relative to carbons, that'll tell you something about what possibilities you have. If you see C5H10, that means either you've got a carbon carbon pi bond, and what was two carbon hydrogen bonds is now a carbon carbon pi bond. You lost two hydrogens to make the pi bond, or you have a carbon, you have a ring structure in there, which basically you can think of that as basically you took the two hydrogens off the end of the ring. The extra plus two is because the carbons at each end of the ring are CH3s, right? You connect those ends together, you lost one hydrogen on each end of the chain to connect them together. Right? So I don't think that's necessary to know for the, the quiz, but just in case it pops up or if you're reading and you see 2n plus 2 rule, that's what it's referring to, how figuring out how the constitutional isomers work. All right, thanks for sticking with me. Extra couple minutes. Um, have a good weekend. Quiz will go live, I think, at like 4 this afternoon is what it's set for. Um, and I'll be around because I had to cancel office hours. I'll be around for another half an hour. If anybody has any questions, wants to talk anything over, I'll be here in my office. <laughs>